After far too long, let's go back to Johto, and today it's with an evolutionary line that's near and dear to my heart. I formed a connection with Mareep, Flaffy, and Ampharos when my fiancé and I started playing Pokemon together just over four years ago. The first games that we played together were Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, and we did these playthroughs as a couple's challenge. Here's how it worked. After every major battle or trial, we would battle each other, and the winner of the battle got to decide on a trade between our teams. Thinking about this now, I think it's sort of a miracle that we're still together, especially with how this challenge played out. So early in the game, you can get Halucha. It's available through an in-game trade. I'd never used one before, so I was excited to try it out. Apparently, it's a complete beast, and Flying Press is an amazing move. I steamrolled my fiancé with it for our first few battles. Eventually, she added a Mareep to her team and nicknamed it Fleecy. All she did was talk about how much she loved it. So what did I do? I stole it through the power of Cha the Halucha the next chance that I got. Our challenge devolved from that point into a brutally competitive fight for control of Fleecy. I started out very strong, keeping it on my team for the first few islands, but eventually she won it back at the end of the game. So today, let's see how this cute little electric sheep does in a playthrough of the generation that it was introduced in. By the way, I've really fleshed out my descriptions of these videos, so they now include the rules, a bunch of software that I use to film the videos, a guide for changing your starter, and a lot of other info. Please check it out, and now let's get into the challenge. Being back in Johto is really refreshing because all the back sprites look so good. Although, it sort of feels like Mareep is hovering in this case. Oh well. Here's an ironic fact about the Mareep line. It actually isn't available in Crystal. So yeah, it's only available in gold and silver. I find this pretty suspicious. Did Game Freak realize that they'd given us a cool new Pokemon too early in the game, in the previous releases, and then restrict it in this game as a result? Like, why would we want to try Pokemon like Gligar, Murkrow, Houndoom, or Mareep? Clearly we should only be using them after the League or by trading with our friends. This is unfortunate, because the Mareep line is very cool. It's the first three-stage electric type ever introduced. When I was checking the National Pokedex, I was actually surprised how few of these there are. Luxray is the next original line, followed by Electros. Magnezone, Electivire, and Alolan Golem change already introduced Pokemon into three-stage electric types, and Chargebug and Vikavolt gain the electric typing when they evolve from their initial stage. Since these three-stage electric types are so rare, I'm really excited to try Ampharos out today. Overall, this line's stats are quite balanced, with the exception of its special attack, which is exceptional. The biggest downside, though, is that it's a slow electric type, which is not the norm. However, Thunder Wave and Paralysis could be useful to make up for this downside in a pinch. As a mono-electric type, it resists electric, steel, and flying moves. Its same type moves are strong against flying and water types, and it's weak to ground. Plus, these are immune to electric attacks. Examining Mareep's move pool, it's pretty clear that I'll need a solution for them. While Flaffy and Ampharos get access to Thunder Punch and Fire Punch, notably Ice Punch is missing. Without it, Mareep doesn't have a good solution for ground types or dragon types. So I set my Mareep's DVs so that it will have a base 70 Hidden Power Ice. That'll solve both of these problems. By the way, Hidden Power is determined exclusively using the attack and defense DVs in this game. What that means is that these two DVs won't be perfect, but it does leave my special and speed untouched. Very convenient, especially for this Pokemon. One combo that stands out to me on Mareep's moveset is Thunder and Rain Dance. When used in the rain, Thunder bypasses accuracy checks, so it like doesn't have trash accuracy anymore. Rain also has the added advantage that it cuts the power of Solar Beam and the healing potential of Synthesis. Red's Venusaur has these moves, so maybe that's a good strategy for me to shoot for. However, using the Move Tutor for Thunderbolt might be better because this doesn't require a turn of setup. Plus, Blue and Red really like to set up Rain Dance themselves, with Gyarados and Blastoise respectively. Today, the rival has Totodile, and uh, this is just a mistake by me. I thought that I gave him Chikorita, and somehow, I did not notice that he had Totodile in this fight. I was clearly thinking about something else. I only realized that the rival has Totodile when I got to Azalea Town. So uh, yeah, mm, oops. In the end, I don't think this is going to matter too much, because the rival is quite bad in these games. 
Anyways, I am going to do a follow-up playthrough today, so in that case, I'll face Chikorita. An added advantage from Reap in the early game is that it has the medium slow growth rate. Ironically, this allows it to level up faster and earlier than Pokemon that have the medium fast growth rate. I grab this Bitterberry, it's going to be very important later. After that, I only have to knock out one optional trainer's Pokemon, and then Mareep learns Thundershock. I catch a Bellsprout and head into Violet City. With an electric move, Mareep is very powerful in the gym, and less so in Sprout Tower, so I'm going to face the birds first. My sheep zaps them out of the sky and makes it to Faulkner with a fantastic time. He opens with Pidgey. There's an interesting interaction here in this fight. His birds know Mudslap and they should prioritize it against Mareep because it's super effective. However, Thundershock one-shots the Pidgey, so that's really good. Next is Pidgeotto. It moves first, uses Mudslap and that lowers my accuracy. Thundershock still hits and does more than half, and it paralyzes. That lets Mareep move first, and that's it. An easy victory against the first gym leader. This sheep is off to a fast start. For now, I'm going to skip Sprout Tower, I'll come back and do it later. It is an optional area, but I'm always going to complete it in my Johto playthroughs. I really don't want to navigate Mount Silver on 4x speed without Flash. On my way south, I grab the very important Paralyzed Cure Berry. I'm saving this for later, I've made the mistake of not getting it before, never again. There's the first Repel available in the playthrough in this grass here, so I pick it up, I'm going to use it in Union Cave. Just outside of the cave, I face another optional trainer because I want Mareep to hit level 15 and evolve before I take Bugsy on. With only Tackle and a subpar attack stat, I save in front of this hiker just in case he's awful. Plus these spinning trainers are really hard to predict in these games. Luckily, I make it past him. On the bottom floor of the cave, I pick up the TM for Swift and I teach it to Mareep. Outside of the cave, I have to dodge Hiker Anthony, another frustrating spinning trainer. In Azalea Town, I stock up on repels and potions. Next, I have to defeat the rockets in Slowpoke Well. I find it sort of strange that Mareep evolves into Flaffy at level 15 instead of level 16. In Generation 1, most Pokemon evolve at level 16, so being one level early always just like felt off. With this evolution comes a nice upgrade to my stats, as well as an expansion to my move pool. Being a bipedal Pokemon, it now has the ability to learn Dynamic Punch, Thunder Punch, and Fire Punch. Now, let's take on Bugsy. He opens with Metapod. I've brought a Poison Cure Berry into this fight just to counter the following Kakuna. However, I don't need it today and his Ace Scyther comes out. It's a flying type, so I should be fine here. I use Thunder Wave to ruin its consistency and hopefully break its Fury Cutter combo, but it doesn't even try to set it up. It uses Quick Attack, Thundershock does half, and then I get a crit. So that's two easy gym leaders. However, the next one is notorious for being difficult. Maybe Flaffy's momentum is going to come to an end. Before that, I have to defeat the rival. In the past, I've prematurely used the Paralyzed Cure Berry in this fight because of the Ghastly. It loves to use Lick and paralyze you on the first turn, but today, I'm not going to do that. Of course, today Lick paralyzes me. Ah, but it doesn't matter because the rival's on easy mode with Croknaw, and he only has Zubat after that, so this is a quick victory. In the forest, I grab a lot of hidden items that are useful in a playthrough. There are actually three that I like to pick up here, a full heal, a super potion, I grab headbutt after that, and then I pick up the ether at the end of the forest. By the way, I'm going to teach headbutt right away because the 30% chance to flinch is so good. In goldenrod, I grab the coin case, buy an abra, and then stop by the department store to grab the TM for thunder punch and fire punch. These are a big upgrade for my move set. I have a big upgrade to my stab move, my same type attack bonus move, and I also have great coverage for steel types now. After heading north and talking to Floria, or the, uh, the Squister, the Squirt Bottle Lady's sister, I teleport back to town and face Whitney. Clefairy's first. There isn't any way for me to set up here, so I just take it out right away. Thunder Punch does more than half, Clefairy uses Metronome, it selects Transform, so my second Thunder Punch doesn't quite knock it out. I take it out with Fire Punch on the next turn, and then Miltank hits the field. Okay, so it's a showdown now between two farmyard Pokemon. Which one is superior? The cow starts rolling, I use Thunder Wave to cut its speed and hopefully break the chain. Instead of using Thunder Punch, I then go for Headbutt because it can cause a flinch. This could also break the combo. 
I want to stack together everything I can to make a rollout stop. Unfortunately, it hits a second time, my berry heals, I headbutt again, and Miltank's combo ends because of paralysis. Now it's time for Thunder Punch. It almost KOs, Miltank uses a tract, but Flaffy is heartless like I was when I stole it from my fiance. It still lands its Thunder Punch, and that's it. So yeah, no delays so far, this run is feeling great. Where is the first challenge gonna be? I'm not sure, this is feeling really easy. Next, I have to clear Sudowoodo. I've been contemplating allowing myself just to run away from it. It's almost never a challenge, and I've been running away from Snorlax in yellow ever since my Porygon playthrough. Plus, Johto playthroughs are really long anyways. The time commitment is actually one of the reasons that I haven't been able to make one of these videos in Crystal recently. After clearing the tree, I get access to this NPC who gives me the magnet. It's a held item that boosts the power of electric type moves by 10%. I put it to use right away against the Kimono Girls. Before I face Morty, I'm going to need to defeat the rival in Burned Tower. He's not optional in Crystal. Haunter moves first, uses Lick, and Thunder Punch just barely doesn't KO. Okay, it's like I'm really used to it using Curse on the first turn. I'm so confused why it didn't. Anyways, Magnemite's next. Fire Punch is an easy one hit. Now, I hope you see why I wasn't too worried which starter he picked, because Fire Punch would easily manage Bayleaf here. So really the only battle that would have been harder is the one that's in Azalea Town, and I think that Swift probably would have been enough for that. Now, before I face Morty, I'm gonna need to prepare. His Gengar is probably gonna live through a Thunder Punch, so I head east and grab the Mint Berry, which restores sleep. After that, since I'm here, I face the only mandatory trainer on this route, and that gives Flaffy enough experience to level up to 30. While this sheep might be slow statistically, it's fast to evolve and to get through all the trainers in this game. So now, with an Ampharos, I teleport back to Ecrotique City and face Morty. He leads with Ghastly. It likes to use Curse first turn, so I'm hoping for a one hit. I get it. Haunter's next. It comes out, and it's also a one hit. But the following Gengar moves first with Mean Look, Thunder Punch doesn't get the KO as predicted, and it uses Hypnosis. The Ghost's attack misses. So I don't use my Mint Berry here, and Gengar goes down. So that's 4 for 4 on Gym Leaders. Ampharos is very dominant, and I'm starting to think that maybe it won't slow down. It's time for errands. I grab some Super Repels and Great Balls. With them, I catch myself a Krabby. It's a great HM Mule because it learns Surf, Strength, and Whirlpool. I'll use the Gift Dratini for Waterfall. I chat with Jasmine in the Lighthouse and spend some time with Dennis. If you're wondering who he is, check out my Steelix vs. Scissor video for the story. In the next city's gym, I have to defeat the tag team trainers with Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan. They're both easy for Ampharos, and now it has to go up against Chuck. I decided to bring the Magnet into this fight instead of the Mint Berry, because I'm very sure that Thunder Punch is going to one-hit the Polyrath. I clear the Primeape with a critical hit, and Chuck's Ace comes out. Thunder Punch zaps the Water type, and that's a one-hit, so yeah, a fifth easy gym battle. I'm off to the Lake of Rage now, this hiker stops me. These spinning trainers are so annoying. Honestly, the battles in Johto have been so consistent and quick for Ampharos, it's really only losing time when trainers like this annoy me. The Red Gyarados is an easy one hit, I grab Hidden Power, and I start the grind that is the Rocket plotline. At least Ampharos can one hit everything in its path here. I've got Fire Punch to solve the scientists that have the Magnemite line, and it also helps me against the occasional gloom that show up. I find this a strange Pokemon for a rocket to pick. Anyways, with that tedium out of the way, I head over to Price's gym. In the moment, I decided to train here because I was a bit worried about Jasmine who's next, but after a single trainer, I was just like, why am I doing this? Ampharos is so great. Like, let's just face Price. Seal is first. This is one of my least favorite Pokemon, so being able to use Thunder Punch on it is so satisfying. Price chooses Piloswine next because it has a type advantage, despite not knowing any ground moves. What a wonderful Pokemon for a gym leader to have. Why doesn't this thing learn Dig, by the way? It actually doesn't learn Dig. Like, it can only learn Earthquake and Mud Slap. <laughs> ah! My strategy here is to use Headbutt to occasionally cause flinches. Blizzard does almost nothing to Ampharos. A Hyper Potion heals Piloswine, but it doesn't prevent the KO, which comes after three more Headbutts. Dugong is last, and Thunder Punch takes care of it. Now, Jasmine is usually one of the strongest gym leaders in Johto. So because of that, I want to run two key groups of errands before facing her. The first are in Violet City. Here I pick up a rare candy and I complete Sprout Tower. 
Might as well get this done now. Then I head to Azalea Town to do my second group of errands. The first is to pick up the prize charcoal in the Cutmaster's house. Yeah, this is uh, this is just free. You just get this. Thanks for commenting on my Ho vs. Lugia video. Like, I must have got over 100 comments telling me I should have picked this up. Next, I venture into Slowpoke Well and I retrieve the TM for Rain Dance. Alright, now I think I'm ready for the Steel Master. Holding a burnt stick, my bipedal sheep is ready to punch her iron Pokemon into oblivion. The first Magnemite takes massive damage from Fire Punch and falls. Jasmine chooses the second Magnemite, and it's no different. Her Ace Steelix is last. It's a ground type, but just like Price, it knows no ground moves. However, that doesn't even matter, because my slow sheep is still faster. Fire Punch melts the snake away. Surprisingly, the rocket plot lines up next, and I actually have something to talk about. I'm always trying to improve my playthroughs and learn more efficient routes through every area of the game. I figured one out here. Normally, I've been going to the department store to obtain return first, and then returning to the radio tower after. However, I can stomp all the rockets in the radio tower first, and then head to the underground. Rival here doesn't pose much of a threat because all of his Pokemon are awful and underleveled. Once I complete this section of the plot and obtain the card key, I can just use the elevator from the basement to go to the fifth floor and grab return. That cuts a small amount of time spent backtracking. All these little efficiencies eventually do add up, so I'm excited to add this one to my repertoire. While I'm here, I also stock up on a bunch of extra TMs. These are going to be relevant later on. Ice Path is next. I think the new crystal version of the tile set is finally starting to grow on me. In here, I pick up the Nevermelt Ice, which is going to be incredibly useful because Blackthorn City is next. At the end of the cave, I grab the Protein and the PP up, and then it's time to teach Fleecy Hidden Power Ice. While this move ranges from 30 to 70 power, I've ensured that it's 70 power today. Stacking the 10% boost from the Nevermelt Ice on top of super effective damage against dragons, this move is going to have an effective power of 154. But will it be enough to manage Claire? Her, uh, her Kingler is very powerful after all, because it's a dragon type, just like Venomoth. Dragonair is first. I use Hidden Power and it one hits. Claire takes a page out of Lance's book and follows the first Dragonair up with two more. In this case though, three are not better than two. <laughs> the King is last. It's sort of ironic here that the Gym Leader's Pokemon have the same gender as the leader in these games. So yeah, this is more of a Queendra. It's easy for Fleecy to manage and that concludes the Johto Gym Challenge. No resets. I grab Dratini, which is going to be my Waterfall Mule, and then I'll point out a hidden item that I like to pick up here. East of the building, right beside this glitched Dragon Fang, there's this rock, and on it there's a Max Elixir. This could be very useful for the Johto League, for Kanto to prevent trips to the Pokemon Center, or when training to level up for Red if he proves to be a challenge. He, uh, probably will. He's always quite brutal. <laughs> the errands that I mentioned earlier allowed me to buy escape ropes, so I can just efficiently leave the cave without any need for backtracking. Now it's time to collect rare candies. South of Goldenrod, I pick up the nugget beside this hidden rare candy. Then in the Whirlpool Islands, there's also a nugget just before the rare candy. Mount Mortar is the last Johto rare candy that I'll grab right now, and then I'm off to Tojo Falls. Before scaling the waterfalls though, I pick up another rare candy. So while I smash my rival, let's review how things look for the league. Fleecy's moveset is Thunder Punch, Thunder Wave, Light Screen, and Hidden Power Ice. Love Disk hasn't been invented yet, so there's no move reminder, and that's why I'm keeping Thunder Wave and Light Screen. I might need them, especially to outspeed Lance if he paralyzes me. I'm also thinking about Aerodactyl. Honestly, Ampharos has been impressing though, and I predict that it's going to continue through the league, but there's only one way to find out, so let's do this. Will is first, and he's really a bad substitute for Lorelei. Thunder Punch KOs Zatu, Jinx is next, it survives but misses Lovely Kiss. Hidden Power one-shots Executor without a crit, I'm surprised about that. His next Zatu falls, and then Thunder Punch one hits Slowbro. Okay, that was very easy. For Koka, I decided that Thunder Wave is probably the move to give up. Fire Punch takes care of all of his first three Pokemon with ease. Venomoth is, after all, a grass type. Look at this Pokemon card. It's just proof. Also, check out my Venomoth video for answers. 
Mox survives, gets paralyzed, and falls. Crobat is last, and Thunder Punch does it. A second easy league member. This Koga fight really reminds me of the hiker in Generation 1. But up next is Bruno. He's the real deal. Thunder Punch doesn't KO the Hitmontop, and it uses Dig. Okay, that's not an ideal way to start this fight. And uh, look how much damage it does to Ampharos. What? <laughs> Bruno is so bad. Onyx is next, Hidden Power 1 hits. Thunder Punch almost KOs Hitmonlee, so it attacks once before falling. Hitmonchan's next. By the way, these two fighting types actually got decent special defense in Generation 2 when the stat was split. Because of that, Hitmonchan gets to attack twice with priority Mach Punch before it faints. Machamp is last. I decided on Fire Punch in case it burns. It does less than half, no burn, and Machamp retaliates with Cross Chop. That did a lot. Thunder Punch hits, and it's enough though to finish the fight. So Bruno put up the strongest fight yet in the entire playthrough. Ah, the irony. For Karen, the Bitterberry that I grabbed at the start of the game is going to be key. Umbreon loves to use Sand Attack first turn and then use Confuse Ray the second turn for maximum troll. Good thing I had the berry because Thunder Punch doesn't do half and I'm able to heal my confusion as a result. I didn't realize though that my damage range was going to be that close. In this case, if I held the Magnet, I would have prevented confusion anyways by just knocking it out on the second turn. And then I would have had more damage for the rest of the fight. I miss Fire Punch on Vileplume because I have to, like Sand Attack just has to make you miss at least like five times. Luckily, Karen misses Stun Spore, but Vileplume survives Thunder Punch and paralyzes. Now Fleecy has 27 speed. Just wonderful. I take some chip damage on the Vileplume, but that isn't the real issue. Gengar follows. It sets up Curse. I don't take damage because it faints, but Houndoom survives. That allows it to do damage with Flamethrower, Paralysis prevents my turn, and Ampharos falls for the first time. So you'll notice that in the next fight I still went with Bitterberry. I was worried that Sand Attack would cause me to miss, and then I'd be confused as well. This way I think I have a slightly better chance to 3 hit the Umbreon. Fire Punch rolls better damage and KOs the Vileplume this time, so no Paralysis, that's really nice. But Gengar is faster, it paralyzes with Lick, and then it uses Destiny Bond. This is one of the silliest ways to lose in the Johto League. It's like when Fortress explodes. Paralysis combined with Curse Damage give Ampharos a third loss, and then Destiny Bond strikes again and gives me a fourth reset. Come on! Alright, so it's uh, time to bring the Magnet with me. Umbreon's first, Thunder Punch doesn't even do half. What? Come on! It uses Confuse Ray turn 1. Like, does it even ever do that? No, it always uses Sand Attack. What is this? Does it just know what item I have equipped? It's so frustrating. Anyways, this uh, doesn't make any sense because it used Confuse Ray when I had the Bitterberry before, so it clearly doesn't know the item. This is just randomly bad luck. Just great. My second Thunder Punch does enough damage, and that's the KO. Fire Punch 1 hits Vileplume, and now it's time for Gengar. Please, no Destiny Vaunt. Curse is first, self-inflicted confusion damage, and then curse damage, and then Gengar licks. At least it doesn't paralyze this time. Thunder Punch KOs, and that prevents curse damage. I do more than half to Houndoom, it uses Flamethrower, and Fleecy just barely survives the Flamethrower damage. Thunder Punch finishes Karen's ace for the first time, and all she is left with is Murkrow. I just need to move first. I do, and that's it. I've reached the champion. For this fight, I give Ampharos the Never Melt Ice. Knocking the Dragonites out before they use Thunder Wave is going to be key to success. With Gyarados out of the way, I see if my damage range is enough. It is, without a crit. That's really encouraging. But was it a favorable roll? Apparently not, because the next Dragonair faints as well. Lance surprisingly chooses his level 50 Dragonite next. I really thought that it was going to be his Aerodactyl, and I autopiloted into Thunder Punch. Whoops. <laughs> At least this one doesn't know Thunder Wave. I take it out, Aerodactyl's next. It uses Ancient Power and boosts all of its stats. But Thunder Punch paralyzes, and that gives me the knockout. All that remains is Charizard. A single Thunder Punch seals the deal, and I've done it. Ampharos defeated Lance with a time of 1 hour, 15 minutes, and 16 seconds, at level 55 with 4 resets and a game time of 4 hours and 42 minutes. 
By the way, my auto-splitting program is recording the game time at the exact time that I record my real time. In Kanto, I'm a little inconsistent here because I take the game time that shows in the Hall of Fame instead. So these results for Ampharos are quite good, but I'm not done yet. I spend the money that I've saved to pay the move tutor to teach Ampharos Thunderbolt. Now it's time to stomp Kanto. Sabrina's easy to beat, Ampharos learns Thunder, I don't have enough money to buy the TM in Goldenrod after purchasing Thunderbolt, so I want to put this on my moveset now just in case. I finish up the plot, I'm going really fast, let's fight Surge without the charcoal. Oh, Electro just barely survives and uses Explosion. So that's a really painful reset against a Kanto gym leader. Ah, with charcoal, he's easy. I catch Snorlax with a Master Ball so I don't have to go out of my way to grab leftovers. Hidden Power makes Brock easy. Blaine doesn't resist Thunderbolt. Janine is always bad. And that brings me to blue. Now, I spoke briefly about Rain Dance and Thunder as a combo at the beginning of the video. So I'm going to try it here. I can set up against the Pidgeot, Rhydon falls to Hidden Power Ice, Alakazam follows, does some damage, and gets taken out by a Thunder. For some reason, I choose Thunder against Executor. Like, it's probably just a misclick, I can't remember. Hidden Power would do more, obviously, but I got a crit anyway, so it faints. Arcanine is next. It goes first with Flamethrower, I set up Rain Dance again, and then it crits. Okay, fine, I'll do the fight again. However, this time, I don't bother with Rain Dance. Thunderbolt just one hits the Pidgeot, Hidden Power KOs Rhydon, Thunderbolt finishes Alakazam, Executor survives Fire Punch, but it starts Solar Beam and faints without doing anything. Arcanine is next, Thunderbolt doesn't quite KO, but Blue starts to use full restores, and so I get to take it out anyways. Gyarados is easy to clean up, and now there's only one challenge left. You'd think it's red. Actually, it's blue, the challenge that is, because I forgot Misty. <laughs> Well, she's not a challenge though, because I was an electric type, so there actually is only one challenge next, and it isn't blue, it's it's actually red. I've used all 10 rare candies to bring Ampharos up to level 74 to give it the best chance against him. Pikachu is still faster, uses charm, sharply lowering my attack, and putting it in double digits. But I don't mind here, because I only have special moves. Ampharos sets up the rain, Pikachu's Thunder doesn't do very much because they resist it, and mine KOs. Espeon sets up Reflect, Thunder hits, and it doesn't quite do enough. At least it paralyzes. I take it out, Snorlax hits the field, I use Thunder, it does half, and Amnesia boosts its special defense. As a result, my next Thunder is so uninspiring. Body Slam crits, and oh my, that leaves Ampharos with bread health. And making matters worse? It also paralyzes. This loss makes me think that I need a physical move for the Snorlax. But even that might not work because of Pikachu's charm. I'm going to do some more training instead to see if I can move first against the Pikachu. Stat experience might give me the edge that I need. At level 77, I'm unfortunately not moving first. Pikachu misses charm though. Rain Dance gets set up and I knock it out with Thunder. Espeon faints to a single hit now and that's an improvement. The same scenario plays out against Snorlax. I get it to low health, but then it heals with rest. Once again, Body Slam paralyzes, and that forces me to use rest. At least in Generation 2, my speed is recovered when paralysis is cured. And then, I crit Snorlax. This gives me the momentum that I need to knock it out and move on to Venusaur. Hidden Power does half, it starts Solar Beam, and I knock it out. Blastoise time. I choose Thunder, it misses because there's no rain, and Surf does damage. I think that I'll need to heal here to play safe. I've only got one more thunder after all, so I want to set up Rain Dance before I use it. By taking my time, I'm able to defeat the Blastoise and move on to Charizard. It uses Flamethrower, the rain cuts the damage, and Hidden Power does very little. This is because, starting in Generation 2, Fire-types resist Ice-type moves. Its Flying-type does make it take neutral damage here. I thought I would be doing more. Also, I'm sort of kicking myself for not using PP-ups on Thunder. I decide to rest because the Charizard is faster, the rain wears off during this, and because of that I only get one more attack in before there's a need to heal. But Charizard ends up finishing Ampharos off before I can take it out. That required luck from a crit, so I'm going to level up a little bit more. 
two levels higher, I decide to go full Johto and uh, just use the moves that this game wants me to use. Sleep Talk, Rain Dance, Thunder, and Rest. The issue though that I'm still running into is that Snorlax is just a complete wall, like I need a solution for this. I wish that Charm wasn't ruining my physical attack. Now I'm going to go for something that I don't think I've ever done before, at least successfully, and I'm completely serious about this strategy. What if I use Dynamic Punch? It actually might be the best option here. While it does have essentially a 5% chance to hit, it does cause confusion, and that might make Snorlax miss a rest or a body slam. I arrive with red health, and I have to use rest as a result. I don't have sleep talk because I have to have fire punch for Venusaur. Ampharos wakes up and has enough time to use dynamic punch. A miracle occurs because it hits, and it does a third to Snorlax. Okay, time to heal again. While I'm asleep, confusion prevents an attack, and then a second miracle occurs, and dynamic punch hits Snorlax again, taking it to red health. I think that I can take it out with Thunderbolt now, I risk it, and it works. Fire Punch 2 hits Venusaur, I have better accuracy for Blastoise now, but I choose Rest because Charizard is going to outspeed. Because I start this turn on low health, Blastoise selects Surf, attempting to KO, but it doesn't get it because I healed. But then it sees that it can't get the KO anymore because I'm at full health, so it sets up Rain Dance. That allows me to take only a single boosted Surf before I knock it out with Thunderbolt. Charizard is last. I have the PP and the accuracy required though. It faints, and Ampharos clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 56 minutes, and 42 seconds, with 9 resets at level 79, and a game time of 6 hours and 49 minutes. So now, let's go back and test this cool electric sheep. I think that there are 3 fights that are in need of some attention. Bruno, funnily enough, Karen, and Red. The reason that I want to test Bruno is that I can't do enough damage to him so his team members are wearing me down slowly before the Machamp comes out. It might get the occasional KO because of this. However, I just remove Fire Punch and I add Headbutt onto my moveset. By the way, you can actually purchase the TM for this in the Goldenrod department store after you've talked to the guy in the forest and obtained it the first time. This way, if I'm not going to one hit, at least my first turn can go for a potential flinch. That would improve my chances because it'll reduce the overall damage that I take statistically. For the Hitmonchan, I just use Thunder Punch because Paralysis could prevent its priority Mock Punch. Machamp is last, and with one flinch, I'm already in a better place going up against it. My Thunder Punch does crit though, so this isn't a great test. I have to see if I have the damage range required to KO it after I use Headbutt once. Let's see. Apparently, the answer is not always. Sometimes they can get rolls and that allows for the KO, but it's not consistent. Also, flinches are only going to happen 30% of the time, and in these cases, Machamp is going to attack twice. But Ampharos survives! Just barely, I'll admit it, so it's quite scary, but that's a good thing to know. Now, I did need to train up more for red, so what if I arrive at this fight 3 or so levels higher? Maybe then the ranges won't be an issue. And that turns out to be the case, so I think that leveling up a little bit more before the league is going to make this much more consistent. That will also make Karen easier, uh, unless this happens. I crit Umbreon and then proceed to sweep the rest of her Pokemon. So yeah, what's going on here? This was much harder last time. I know that I'm three levels higher, but it shouldn't make this sort of difference. And then the next fight is exactly what I expected. Sand attack from Umbreon, paralysis from Vileplume, curse from Gengar, and flamethrower to finish from Houndoom. However, I didn't need my Paralyzed Cure Berry for Lance before, and if I'm going to be a few levels higher, I'm really not going to need it now. That means that I can use it here against Karen. I try Headbutt to see the damage range on Umbreon, maybe I can cause a flinch and prevent the sand attack. Well, uh, this isn't a good idea, because then Thunder Punch doesn't KO. Vileplume goes down to Hidden Power when it's hit, and Gengar's next. But Destiny Bond is so annoying, I need a solution for this move. So, in Generation 2, all the trainer classes have specific DVs assigned to them. In Karen's case, she has 7 attack, 15 defense, 15 special attack and defense, and 13 in speed. So I'm going to have to outspeed a very fast Gengar, and I'm going to have to take it out when it has perfect defenses. At level 45, its speed stat is 117, and uh, look at Fleecy's speed in the bottom left. This is after the badge boost has been applied. I have 113 speed, so I only need 5 more to move first. However, because the sheep has a low base stat, I need to use 3 rare candies to finally ensure that I'm going to move first against the Gengar. 
These levels will improve my damage output. If I keep Thunder, I can use it against the Gengar and I can one hit. This might be a good gamble on turn one. If I don't and it uses Destiny Bond, then I'm safe. And if it uses Curse, then I can KO it the next turn. So here's a montage of footage that I recorded trying to test these scenarios. This uh, art piece is titled Payback for the Crimes Against Fleecy. <laughs> in every case, my thunder misses, Gengar uses Spite. It must be trying to spite Karen instead though, because this really isn't a good play. However, I do wonder if the AI is programmed to use Spite when you select a move that has less than a certain PP. Maybe like less than 11? I tried Thunder Punch to test it, but apparently this one hits now too. So Thunder isn't even useful here. And then I realized why Spite was being spammed. It's an error in my testing methodology. I think that the RAM of the game selects the opponent's move before you select yours. So this Gengar is just always locked into Spite because it's already selected it. I was using a save state to test this Gengar, and in Generation 1 this actually works. The AI rolls the move after the turn starts, but in this game it appears to be happening before I select my move. So resetting the battle and making it back to Gengar, I now find that it actually does use other moves. Still, even when it does, the fight is a lot easier now. So the plan here is that I need to have 6 additional levels of training before the league. That means that I'll be starting to face Will at level 57. And that way I can save all my rare candies for red. Now he's the last trainer that I need to test. Unfortunately, level 79 isn't a guarantee for Snorlax. Like, I'm just taking too much damage here and not dealing enough. However, there might be another option. Ampharos is already slow, so what if I use Curse on Pikachu? That's because I can tank all of its electric attacks really easily, and the only other move it knows is Quick Attack, which is going to be very useless. Also, this is going to let me use Return as my primary physical damaging move, and then the uh, Johto gods are going to smile on me. This is way better than the other options that I've tried. One complicating factor here is that it is possible for Pikachu to use Curse more times than I can boost my attack. But I could save all my PP ups for Curse, and then that'll be less risky. I can just continue setting up if it uses another charm. Even with a bit of an attack boost, I'm set up for greater success in sweeping Red's team now. I just need to be careful to heal when my health is low because I'm very slow. Ideally I can do this at Snorlax because my defense is so high now I can just resist its physical attacks. By the way, the Snorlax is really his only physical attacker, everything else are special attackers. After that, Venusaur, Blastoise, and Charizard could knock me out if I haven't been careful. Still, I think that this is the best strategy for a consistent result against Red. It's so good, it's on theme with Johto, and I wonder if it can actually work at a lower level. Initially, I made it to red at level 64, so let's try at this level and see if it's possible. If it isn't, I can just level up incrementally and figure out when it's going to start working. This time, I use the PP ups on Curse, and I accidentally pushed my setup a bit too far. Oops, I wasn't paying attention. After that, return KO's Pikachu, Espeon moves first, hits a big Psychic, but I live on red. Now, Snorlax uses Amnesia first, and that means that it actually knew it couldn't KO me with Body Slam. When I'm at red health, my defense is so high that it prevents the KO, so that's really good to know. I still do enough damage to take it out, Venusaur is a one hit, Blastoise takes two, and Charizard falls to a single return. Okay, so that win is kind of unbelievable, because it's like 15 levels lower than I was before. I can even improve this by teaching Ampharos Sleep Talk in the place of Thunderbolt. Like yeah, why would an electric type need an electric move in this game? That way, when I heal against Snorlax, I can still actually do damage. Furthering the improvements, I can make it hold a mint berry, and so when I use rest for the first time, I'll just wake up right away. Pikachu eventually depletes thunder, after that it starts to use thunderbolt and quick attack so I'm not taking as much damage, and then I can knock it out. So I'm going to continue healing until I see these moves, that way I have enough health for the rest of the fight. That ensures that Espeon can't KO with Psychic. From here, I should ensure that I proceed past Snorlax when I'm awake though and with green health. After return knocks Venusaur out, then Blastoise is going to set up rain because of my health. Without the rain on my side, Ampharos is actually going to lose against the Charizard. And then I had a thought. Sleep Talk isn't really helping here because it makes the turns less predictable. I want to know when I'm going to be awake. I don't want Sleep Talk to choose rest and put me back to sleep. That's very frustrating. Instead, I can bring Rain Dance into the fight, and since I'm moving second against the Venusaur, I can use it to outsmart the AI and remove the sun. Now, since it outspeeds, it's actually going to try to set up the sun over and over again, 
If I use a single PP up, that way I'm going to outlast and be able to set up the rain consistently. However, I realize an obvious flaw with this strategy. After I've stalled the Venusaur out and depleted all of its sunny day, it's actually going to attack and do damage, and then I won't survive Blastoise's following attack because it's boosted because of the rain. There are several options here. Cotton Spore could lower Venusaur's speed, Thunder Wave could paralyze and lower speed, and Light Screen could decrease special damage. But all these options require taking a deadweight move on my moveset for a large portion of the playthrough. So what about Protect? I actually think this move might be amazing here. I can negate the effects of Pikachu's common turn 1 charm with it. From there, it isn't useful until I get back to the Venusaur. Here, I can use it to negate Solar Beam if it gets set up without the sun. If my health is high, it's going to see it doesn't have any damage ranges to knock me out, so it's going to set up with Sunny Day. And if my health is lower, then I can just attack and prevent Solar Beam on the next turn. In this case, the AI just has no idea that Solar Beam takes a turn to charge, so if it sees that it has the damage roll to KO with Solar Beam, it just goes for it. And then it charges up and I can just protect and that's that. This same AI interaction though, ends up being a liability against the Blastoise after Charizard faints. In this case, it sees a KO range, goes for it, gets a bad roll, and Ampharos survives, taking the victory. So I think if I have one or two more levels than 64, this is all going to be much easier because I'll be taking less damage. What all this means is that I don't need all my rare candies right before red, so I can use them earlier in the playthrough to make other challenges easier. So, remember the six levels of training that I said I needed before Bruno and Karen? Yeah, I can just use rare candies right before the league and dramatically improve my performance. Then, if I use the candies that I find in Kanto right before Red, I'm actually going to be a much higher level than 64, and I'll probably sweep through with this strategy. But I might have missed something, after all these tests aren't perfect, and that's why I like to do second playthroughs. So let's see how Ampharos does in its next playthrough. The first major change in this run is that I'll be facing off against the rival when he chooses Chikorita. Hopefully this is going to provide a little bit more of a challenge. However, the first fight is just like, slower, it's not more difficult, it's just annoying. Faulkner is next, he gets really annoying with Mud Slap, it causes Mareep to miss, and eventually he wins. That's an early reset. Luckily I went on my next attempt, but I'm a little bit shaken by this. In Union Cave, I fail then to successfully dodge this hiker, and it gets really bad. This fight is so slow, and unfortunately, his chip damage with his really weak Geodudes finishes Mareep off. I dodge him successfully after resetting, I clear the cave, and I save in front of Hiker Anthony. At this point, it's sunk in. I need to adjust my early game to compensate for Faulkner's Mud Slap, and for this hiker's ground types. There is an easy solution here, so I'm going to restart this playthrough and try all over again. After all, my uh, fiancé probably wouldn't forgive me if I didn't give Fleecy a uh, fair result. This time, I train on wild Pokémon in the early game. This makes the rival easier in the first fight because Mareep is doing much more damage. I fight all the trainers this time, I'm not skipping any, and that allows me to arrive at Faulkner at level 12. Pidgey is a one-shot as always. Pidgeotto just isn't, but I don't miss my second turn and that's it. No resets so far. Now, all of this training that Mareep's done propels its level forward, but it's not quite enough for the trainer. I keep fighting optional trainers on the next route, so that when I reach the hiker, I have a Flaffy. I don't manage to dodge him, but because I've evolved, I can defeat all of his Pokémon very easily. My heart races as I prepare to skip Anthony. Like, ah, uh, just so scary getting by these guys. Luckily I'm successful, and things speed up a lot from here. Bugsy is simple, and next is the rival. Here he has Bayleaf for the first time, and it knows Razor Leaf, which has a high critical hit ratio. Here's the thing, Paralysis and Swift are enough for me to knock it out, even when he has Reflect set up. So yeah, this fight wasn't an issue as I predicted. But I do have an issue coming up. I was so hyper focused on all of this training, that I actually forgot to catch a Bellsprout for Cut. So there are Paris in this forest. However, they only have a 5% chance to spawn, and then... I forget that I'm in Johto, and all the Pokemon here in the wild are just ridiculously underleveled. So yeah, I try to do damage to it to get a uh, better chance to catch, and I knock it out. So I've bled a lot of time now, so I'm going to restart all over again. These mistakes are a bit painful. I'm uh, sorry you have to experience them with me. But I am able to make a few corrections this time. These result in one more additional level and a more streamlined strategy against Bugsy. I can just spam Thundershock. Thunder Wave is really wasting time. The rival is easy again, confirming my suspicion that he doesn't have an ace that is good against the Ampharos line. 
I backtrack to grab the charcoal, I pick up Headbutt, and then I face Whitney. Now, I have Paralysis and Flinch on my side, but this fight was close. Still, I managed to emerge victorious. Next, I grab the Mint Berry, defeat the rival, and now I have Fire Punch, so Bayleaf is even worse here. Morty's a bit more annoying because I get put to sleep twice, however my sheep is too strong. Chuck's easy, the rocket plotline is easy and boring, Price is easy, Jasmine's easy, and the final rocket plotline is easy. So that's a lot of easy, <laughs> and Claire continues this trend. Now that I've dispatched the rival and reached the league, I can use rare candies to bring Ampharos up to level 59. This has a consequence. It makes everything very easy. <laughs> I'm able to one-shot all of Will's Pokemon now. The only survivor on Koga's team is Muck, but uh, do you want to survive when you look like that? Probably not. I've made it back to Bruno. He's the first trainer that I wanted these additional levels for. Turns out, at this level, Headbutt just one hits the Hitmonlee, and Hitmonchan faints to Thunder Punch. So that's much easier. Machamp is last. Thunder Punch almost does enough, and now because I've taken less damage, the AI clearly knows that it can't KO me, so what's it gonna do? It's gonna set up with Foresight. Sorry, uh, I'm forgetting who I'm facing right now. Mm, I guess he acts like a hiker, so yeah, he, he must be a hiker. While that guy was easy, Karen might not be. I go into this without a Bitterberry so that I get the extra damage instead. I'm gonna two-shot the Umbreon as a result, and it's gonna use Sand Attack on the first turn, which is annoying. As a result, Fire Punch misses Vileplume and it paralyzes me. Great. Just great. Gengar curses, I take it out, but Houndoom does too much damage, and Ampharos gets its first reset here again at Karen. There's a simple solution here, just use the Paralyzed Cure Berry. In this case, if I miss on Vileplume, the status will be healed. However, everything lines up in this fight, so I take a win very easily. So Lance is last, and he's the champion with underleveled Dragonites. So let's hold up here, we can watch the fight while I have a Scott's Theories moment. What if the Lake of Rage is to blame for this? We know that it was forcing Magikarp to evolve prematurely. Maybe when Lance was investigating the situation, he was training three new Dragonairs. The transmission forced them to evolve prematurely, and thinking that they must be special, they must be more powerful Dragonairs, he decided to use them in this battle as his team. Or maybe I'm just making excuses for the developers because they just messed up the level curve by trying to fit another region into the game. Ah, uh, anyways. So here we have it, all the footage from my Kanto Gym battles. This time I remembered Charcoal for Surge, so Fleecy sweeps all of them and arrives at Red just under 1 hour and 30 minutes. I teach Curse, Rest, Return, and Protect for the most Gen 2 flavored moveset of all time. This is a Johto challenge after all. And then I go head to head with him. Pikachu's first, and here I want to set up Curse. As I said before, I really wanted to stop using Thunder. After that, I take it out, I one-hit the Espeon, and I use Return doing more than half to Snorlax. It rests, and my following two returns knock it out. Venusaur's next, I go for Return, it survives... Uh, wait, what? Okay, so this is because Espeon set up Reflect. So yeah, it's to blame for this not being a KO. As a result, the Venusaur gets a Solar Beam off before fainting, and I've only got one third health left. I am really slow, and the sun is still out, so Red chooses Charizard. I try to protect twice to stall it out. It can work on the second turn, it just has a decreased chance in these games. But the second one unfortunately fails, and Ampharos goes down. So I learned something about this fight in this battle. If Espeon sets up Reflect, I just need to buy more time against Snorlax by using Rest. In this case though, the Evolution uses Psychic, I take it down, knock the Snorlax out, one hit Venusaur, survive Flamethrower, but Blastoise, the turtle, is faster than the Electric Sheep, and it knocks me out. However, I really should have just healed more against Snorlax and proceeded with higher health. In the next fight, I get back to Blastoise with a little bit more, it uses Blizzard, misses, and that's it. Ampharos clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 37 minutes, and 20 seconds, at level 72, with 3 resets, and a game time of 6 hours and 6 minutes. Here's the data that I collected for Ampharos. I ended up reducing its time by 19 minutes and 22 seconds with my second playthrough. That's a significant improvement. I saved 43 minutes of game time and finished 7 levels lower. If we examine all the splits and the differences between them, then we can see that the majority of my time was saved at red. I'm really happy with these results for Ampharos. I do think that against Red, it's a little bit inconsistent against the Venusaur Blastoise and Charizard. However, overall, I think that this is the right strategy. Now, let's place it in the tier list. In this case, I think that I need to shuffle Octillery and Piloswine down a tier and place Ampharos in the A tier. 
If it clocked in under 1 hour and 30 minutes, I think that it would deserve the S class with Lugia and Ho, but today I think it's just underneath them. Like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, and comment because I gotta read them all. Thanks to my patrons, your support means the world to me. Now, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. It's bloopers time. So today, let's see how this electric sheep does in a playthrough of Pokemon Crystal. Crystal. <laughs> it moves first and uses Mean Lick. Mean Lick. Mean Lick. Oh my gosh. Now, Jasmine is usually... Usually. Usually. I'm always trying to improve my playthroughs. Yes. In here, I pick up the Nevermelt Ice, which is going to be useful immediately once I get to Blackthorn City. Blackthorn City. Uh, stacking the 10% boast. Boast. Ha! No! It's easy for Fleecy to manage, and that concludes the Johto Gym Challenge. No resets. Johto Gym Challenge. That's kind of hard. Now I can drab... Now I can drab... Yeah, drab... drab Dratini. Blah. I grab Dratini. 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 I grab... Dr dr grab. I obtained... I'm just going to change it to obtain, because I can't say grab Dratini. It's hard. His Ace, Satu Falls, and Thunder Bunch... Thunder Bunch. Huh. I've used all rare... Rare... I've all, I used all rare 10 r candies. I was trying to say, like, put the number between the rare and the candies. Doesn't make sense. At least in Generation 2, speed is recovered when paralysis is recurred. Blah, blah. By the way, these two fighting types actually got decent, decent special defense. Now, Jasmine is usually one of the... Now, Jash, Jashmine. Ah! Plus, Johto playthroughs are really long anyways. This time commitment is one of the reasons that I haven't been able to make any vid vid videos in Crystal lately. James Bond. James <laughs> Stop. It's the worst, worst joke. So apparently I'm actually getting better at reading these scripts and recording the voiceover because we have less bloopers these days. Anyways, I just wanted to say that we only actually have 32 spots left in the Johto Pokedex for the credits. So I can't believe how many of you have signed up to support me on Patreon. Thank you so much. I actually don't have a plan for what I'm going to do when I hit 251. So like, <laughs> I got to figure that out, I guess. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. I'll see you in my next video.